A very good afternoon to you. My name is Eleni Jokas. I am a correspondent and anchor at CNN. I'm delighted to be with you today to announce our next session, Banking on the Future, the Outlook for, Net for Financial Institutions in the GCC and beyond. Now, just a couple of thoughts as we get into the conversation. During the pandemic, banks have been the vital link between governments and people and businesses, the key to unlocking stimulus that was pumped into so many of our markets around the world. Banks help distribute money. And that is in its simplest form, the role of the banks during the pandemic. I want to rewind a little to 2008 and during the financial crisis. Banks were vulnerable. Banks are what caused so many of the issues that we saw during the great financial crisis of 2008. When we look at our current situation and we see not only the vulnerabilities, the disruptive technologies, but we also look at how important banks are in our daily lives, we wonder where are these trends going? What is the future of banking? Do we need the bricks and mortar? Do we need the big buildings? What do consumers want? And how is e-commerce rattling that sector up? I'm delighted to uh, invite our guests on stage to ask some pertinent questions. For example, how banks are leading the financial industry through these fundamental changes? What are the new regulatory policies that are going to shape our future? And what new business models will emerge in 2022 and beyond? I'd like to welcome on stage His Excellency Fahad Al Mubarak, Governor of the Saudi Central Bank. Sama, Your Excellency, please join me. <clears throat> Hussein Abdullah, co CEO of Q Invest. Round of applause for Abdullah, please. Your Excellency, take a seat. Timothy Collins, CEO of Ripplewood Advisors. Take a seat, thank you. Timothy, where are you? The setup is quite confusing, I have to say. I've lost my bearings. Timothy, welcome. Bob Diamond, founding partner and CEO of Atlas Merchant Capital. Round of applause for Bob, please. We'll be grilling him in just a moment. A veteran in the industry. And uh, Frederick Odea, CEO of Societe Generale. So, welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm honored to be in your presence, and I'm excited to talk about possibly one of the most interesting sectors that could shape our future. Your Excellency, I'd like to start with you. And, um, you know, I, I don't take lightly how important central banks have been during the pandemic, during any crisis. You know, we look to you for stability. We look to you to keep your mandate in check. And I'd like to get a sense from you uh, what the biggest lessons have been during the pandemic and how that's shaped the way you think as a central banker in this region. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Elaine, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, the pandemic has been a very devastating uh, crisis to all of us from all aspects, uh, health, social, economic. Uh, the uh, monetary policy and the fiscal policy have dealt with it in order to mitigate and reduce the negative impact. So we immediately looked at the affected uh, sectors, and specifically those small and medium companies where business was basically frozen and uh, lots of jobs were about to be lost. So we extended in the central bank several programs, including uh, payment uh, uh, postponement uh, of delays, as well as uh, offered some guarantees for a new payment for them to keep going, and injected uh, over 52 billion uh, real into the banking system to compensate for this lost businesses in the meanwhile to make sure that banks continue to be liquid. 
This is in addition to uh, cooperation with our colleagues in the fiscal side, where uh, payments uh, have been subsidized and guaranteed to individuals working in some of the most hit sectors. Uh, I believe altogether, uh, government programs have worked very well. And this is not only in Saudi Arabia, but also elsewhere. Yeah. When we discuss this with other governors of Central Bank, we find that similar programs based on the different economies have been implemented. That has definitely mitigated absolutely. the risk of the pandemic. You, you know, you, absolutely. It's throwing these lifelines that were so vital to saving businesses and people over the time of incredible uncertainty. Frederick, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, I know that traditional banking has been for such a long time disrupted by new technologies. And the question is, you know, where are we headed um, in the next few years? Do you feel that the pandemic accelerated some of those disruptions? And for you as a banker, are you worried about what the future would look like for a traditional bank like yourselves? Or do you feel that you already are starting to change the way you see things, that you're ready for the change? Well, first of all, again, thank you very much for, for your invitation. And first of all, I, I would agree with His Excellency. I think the banks did a good job overall in the world, uh, alongside, of course, the government, the central banks, to mitigate the impact of this extraordinary crisis. And when I look at the economic activities across the world, I think we are in a pretty good shape compared at least with uh, what we could have in mind just 12 months ago. So it is encouraging and I'm, I'm pretty constructive uh, going forward. But we are facing formidable transformation. And one of them is, of course, the acceleration of the digitalization. And when I say this, uh, it's not directly necessarily always related to the pandemic. Of course, we have used much more in digital channels, but it also it goes beyond. And we are discussing with central banks about digital central currency. Yeah. Just that, if you wish, in the very short term, uh, in Europe, the ECB talks about a five-year horizon. So it's, it's tomorrow, if I may say. Uh, beyond this, of course, uh, we all know that they, we have more to do to transform our IT infrastructure, to be able to use data in a more uh, efficient way. We have to reduce cost. We talk about crypto assets. Uh, so I think, uh, again, the world, when I think about the next 10 years, it will be fundamentally different. Yeah. The good news for traditional banks, if I may say, and I feel always I'm a little bit like a dinosaur with these young guys uh, in the fintechs, is that we have the trust of our clients. And uh, in this world where you can have also security issues, fraud, we can build on that. The key question now is nevertheless to accept that the disruption will take place and embrace it ourselves. Yeah. So to build ourselves these systems to try to compete. So we'll go through some of those disruptions. Bob, I, I want you to come in here because you know when I think of the, the traditional banking system, I wonder if people are becoming disheartened with banks or is it with the monetary system? Is it with the way, what we feel about currencies? Is it the payment system? Is it the fees we pay where you see people are starting to rotate money into things like cryptocurrencies, for example, that perhaps are really sort of jeopardizing the future of banks as we'd know it, or for central banks, or money, the creation of money as we know it. How are you rationalizing this, this incredible move that we've seen accelerated again during the pandemic? So I think there's two extremely powerful forces at work. Um, the first started after the financial crisis in 2008, and that is significantly higher levels of capital, significantly higher levels of safety in the traditional banks, as, as Frederick referred to them, legacy banks or traditional banks. And that has been pretty steady and in place and didn't change during the pandemic. I think the other is technology. And we've seen a lot of technology on the consumer side with PayPal and Starbucks and um, Venmo um, for years. Uh, but what's happening now and was accelerated significantly during the pandemic um, was institutions like Circle, which is the one that we've recently invested in, looking at the more the commercial application or commercial activity, large payments, treasury and transaction services. And I think 
these two um, forces together mean that the legacy banks, looking at the U.S. as an example, um, the market cap of financial services prior to the crisis was 95% traditional banks. Today, it's less than 70%. And a lot of that is coming from Stripe and Venmo and, and hopefully in the future firms like Circle. So it's specialists, particularly financial, service, uh, uh, financial technology specialists. And I think the result for the traditional banks is they're much more like utilities. They're much safer than they were prior to the crisis for all kinds of reasons. Some better managed, some higher levels of capital but the returns are gonna be more, more um, um, like utilities, the management more like utilities, and like utilities much closer to the government. As Frederick had said, there was much more cooperation. So I think these two forces of, of more um, a safer traditional institutions and the influx of technology is gonna play out significantly, as Frederick said, over the next four or five years. So I'm hearing there's going to be a role for legacy banks, as you call them, more traditional banks yep. in this future. Um, I'd like to bring you in here as well, Hussein, and um, you know, looking at central banks wanting, thinking deeply about central bank digital coins, thinking about how they can sort of take control of some of the digital payments that are going on. I kind of take the story of what's happening in the likes of Kenya, where the fintech industry basically made a telco company more powerful than some of the banks in the country. And I look at these trends and then I wonder, how do you regulate this industry? How do you ensure that you still gain and have control, but allowing it to evolve and transform? Uh, first of all, I'm uh, glad to be among everyone here. Um, to your uh, question, I think uh, uh, where we are today in the region, if I compare it where the US is, for example, or UK or EU, um, we're not there yet when it comes to uh, digitalization. Uh, we, uh, this process, uh, you know, the pandemic did speed up the process of uh, consumer uh, banking only at this stage. Uh, it's, it's going digital. Um, with time, uh, products are being uh, uh, increasing uh, from time to time, but the question uh, becomes uh, uh, when the corporate will follow. There's a question mark there. Well, coming to, to, to uh, the example which uh, Bob gave, which is Circle, um, it's a good example. We were uh, very close to the situation uh, uh, with Bob. I think there are two questions here when it comes to regulatory. Uh, number one is, in this part of the world, we need to take care of also Sharia, Sharia compliant. Yeah. So uh, would, would we classify this uh, as Sharia compliant? I'm not the expert, but given my conversation with them, it needs to be backed or based and highly regulated by the uh, central banks here in the region um, to make it available to to the, to the people here. So, so currently users. cryptocurrencies don't fall under Sharia law, essentially? No. Okay. There's no clear uh, clearance or fatwa uh, uh, to be used. Um, do we want to be there? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, uh, do we understand the cryptocurrency today as is? We all know what it is, but in reality, we don't understand it yeah. in the region, right? So what we're trying to do here is to stay close to the situation understand better, uh, stay close to the, not only the companies, but also the policymakers uh, in US, UK, EU, uh, whereby we learn and try to come up with a product in the near future. The question is when, rather than okay. you know, today or tomorrow. Well, we're gonna ask uh, your excellency in just a moment to answer that, but Tim, I wanna go to you as well. Um, give me, um, I, I, I want, if, if I say you know, the banking industry in five to 10 years, what would that look like for you? And it seems that crypto and sort of digital currencies have come up already. <laughs> would you say that that's going to be the next big disruptor? It already has disrupted, don't get me wrong, but I mean, where it's going to be, you know, worth a lot more. So, um, the short answer uh, is I don't know. And, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure no one does. But before I do, let me just say, before I say anything, and I, actually, I told you in advance, I only have one answer, no matter what the question is. Um, <laughs> so you can ask me what time of day it is, and it's the same answer. First, let me just say, uh, my friend Frederic, I agree with everything you said, and Your Excellency, just clear, I'm not speaking for any bank with which I'm affiliated. I'm, this, is, this is Tim Collins. So 
Um, that having been said, um, I think that we have had a profound period over the last two or three years, yeah. more profound uh, in what we know now and what we can see now that the fog is cleared. And the fog has been cleared to some degree by COVID and to some degree by these disruptive technologies. And I think there are four really profound observations that come out of this. The first and the most, most important is trust. I think you have to be blind not to see the risk of a corrosion of trust around the world. It is profound. It, in my view, is the greatest existential threat to the world, greater even than climate change. Can I ask you, trust towards banking system? Trust, trust towards the towards banks? The, okay. Church. Governments. Okay. Education. Everything. Governments. Currencies. Banks. Drug companies. I mean, this, this prof I mean yeah. the idea in America and parts of Europe that people don't want to take vaccines because they don't trust the government, they don't trust their doctor, they don't trust drug companies. I mean, it's, I, mean I keep hearing these crazy stories about people getting fired or leaving their jobs because they don't want to take a vaccine after, you know, when I was in elementary school, you had to take a vaccine to go to school. So it is that January 6th, the, 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 the myth that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have to take over the capital because our election is rigged. I mean, there is, and cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies exist for two reasons. One, for malign reasons, because people use cryptocurrencies to do bad things, and two, because there is a degradation of trust, and the explosion of cryptocurrencies is about that. And, I mean, I could say nothing else, um, but if we don't attack the loss of trust, we're, 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 banks are in trouble, governments are in trouble, the world is in trouble. So how do you regain that trust back? Because that was also, that also, the trust was eroded during the financial crisis. I mean, but trust has been eroded bit by bit. I mean, yeah. the crisis in the church, the, the, the uh, crisis in, in, uh, in the academy about censorship and, you know, uh, political correctness. It, it, trust is really hard to generate and really easy to lose, and we have lost it in almost every domain. And, 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 and in my view, in my view, it's going to be really hard to regain, and in my view, um, it will take some extraordinarily charismatic leader to step into the breach that uh, creates trust in, and it could be in the church, it could be in the academy, it could be in business, it could be in politics, but that is the single greatest. Democracy, markets, banks, all rely on trust among people, trust in institutions, and without that, uh, I think we have, uh, you know, a growing tendency toward anarchy. Wow. Commercial anarchy, wow. volatility in the markets, you know, meme stocks. Absolutely. What are meme stocks about? Meme stocks are about that no, no one trusts traditional valuation metrics and they trust whatever they got in their social media. And things, things like these, the, the unbelievable power of data analytics mean two things. One, they encourage this... Uh, bifurcation of uh, of information and this trust in in a in a, in, a, in an odd area of uh, uh, of information and they create the potential for this massive dislocation between the wealth and the poor because they yeah. have a tendency to winner take all economics. So I. I, I I've got a whole lot of other things yeah. I could say, well, but I think touch that's on all. Those. This has truly been illuminating, right? Because that's that is all the I really risk, care right? About. Because as inequality grows, there's a big risk of social unrest. Um, Your Excellency, jump in here for me, because you know this is not something you want to be hearing. That you're worried about the erosion of trust towards the government, towards banks, towards the, the efforts that you're involved with on a daily basis. How do you get that back? And is it through regulation? And do you think, I mean, now that we're talking about cryptos, if you come in and you start regulating this market, I mean, that could also create a lot of, um, I guess, concern for those that actually wanted to be out of the system and not being forced to be in the system. Well, I think trust is extremely important. And uh, building trust doesn't come overnight. And it does not uh, come uh, uh, temporary. It has to be established through credible institutions and uh, uh, banks uh, have gained uh, 
trust and respect where they have very stringent regulators uh, that uh, uh, make sure that deposits are protected, transactions are also executed right. Therefore, when we look at all the new technologies in fintech payment system or financing, so long that there is a proper regulator who can uh, watch and make sure that all transactions are within compliance, uh, KYC, know your client. Uh, also, we should not be dealing with any uh, crypto assets that might end up with uh, uh, people who might use it for criminal uh, purposes that we are trying to fight and clear our systems. So it is very important. It is a, a cooperative uh, between the private sector. Are you sector. working on regulatory? Are you look at working on regulation right now within the crypto space as the Saudi Central Bank? Uh, you know, now regulation is trying to catch up with the new innovation in technology and uh, crypto uh, assets and others. May I just correct myself for one yes. second? I, I, the one thing I would like to say, I'm here because I believe that uh, in the kingdom and in, uh, in the UAE, the people believe that the leadership has their best interests at heart. And, yeah. and to, to, to build trust, that is a central link. And I think the popularity of both crown princes is a testament to the transparency that their, their uh, policies are designed for the people that they govern. And that's yeah. really powerful. And, and, that, and that is the thing that yeah, we And that's not trust. actually what we see in the rest of the world, right? So that's... So I yeah. want to go to crypto for a second. And yeah. in supporting what, what Tim had said about trust, I think two things about crypto. One is I worry that we use this word crypto and it kind of covers everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on one extreme, you have Bitcoin, which is a non-government store of wealth, highly speculative. We don't know how the price determines itself. Um, it can be used to hide money from taxes or if you're a crook. And so we have all kinds of issues, but it's not a banking issue. It's very similar to gold in that it's used as a non-government form of, of uh, storage of wealth, very often secretively. On the other hand, you have staple coins, which are a digital version of a currency or the technology applied to make a, a fiat currency digital. And in that case, we're really, in our case, in Circle, we're really, really, really embracing technology. We need more technology. We need the central banks to determine exactly how good that collateral behind the stablecoin. We made an announcement a few weeks ago that we're only having cash uh, in short-term treasuries so that a dollar is always a dollar. Ultimately, we would like to be a bank. We're applying to the OCC to be a full reserve bank, and we would like eventually to hold what's behind that in Fed deposits so it's as safe as, as can possibly be. That's a payment system, and I think that is a banking issue, which is, is there an advantage um, for, uh, for everyone if we continue to take advantage of the internet, which means we can do things instantaneously, seven days a week, in a nanosecond, take advantage of blockchain, which replaces the, uh, the person in the middle who's charging two or three points, um, and have a digital version of that currency so that we can drive the costs of commercial transactions close to zero. That has a benefit, and that'll have a big impact on banking, but boy, it needs to be regulated. And I worry that people think that all crypto's the same and that crypto's trying. Now, our stable coin is, is USDC and Circle. I'll tell you, with Tether, it's an offshore Chinese, a little bit murky collateral pool that does not want to be regulated. So even within stablecoin, there are different kinds of stablecoins. Those, those that are saying, please regulate me, I want to be a bank. So at least it's backed up by something, right? So you know that it's being backed, backed up, up by cash. Bitcoin right. is, you know, crypto is And I think one different. of the biggest worries, you will know this, one of the biggest worries certainly of the Fed in the U.S. is they can never be put in a position as they were in 2008 where they had to bail out money market funds. Yeah. If they have to bail out stable coins, that's not good. Yeah. I mean, that goes right to trust in crisis. So what we're trying to do in circle is we're trying to go so far to the other side 
that we're the most regulated, most conservative, and what we want to do is take advantage or, or, or push the value of, of a digital currency is opposed to be unregulated or make a lot of money on a portfolio or anything like that. And I just, I worry that that phrase crypto covers yeah. so many different things because I really think yeah. Tim's point is accurate, which is if we can have a stable coin, which is trusted and which is highly regulated, that's very different and kind of having just a, a digital currency that's been backed up by, you know, fiat exactly. money. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you've got central then, bank uh, digital coins, which then you, you delve into then, something uh, else. Who wants to go next? Yes. Just yes. to about point, I think this is very important. We hear about crypto assets. We don't call them crypto coins. Uh, uh, and they are the value of the buyer and seller who wants to build. Now, there's the stable coins, which has actually real money behind it. However, where is that money? It is with a third party, and we don't know what is this third party going to do in terms of the liability. Is that a bank? Is it going to be converted to a bank? And that's why central banks now working, including uh, the uh, uh, BIS and IMF, in central bank digital currencies, which trying to replicate the uh, speed, uh, cost, reducing the cost, and speed. Uh, faster transactions, uh, and it is backed by real money at the central bank. Mm -hmm. And the design feature is wide range from wholesale to retail to uh, distributed ledger to central, and it is being now experimented with. And some countries already launched it in a, and also cross-border. We have done one with the United Arab Emirates, and we're working now on a, a big project in Saudi Arabia. That's exciting. Frederick, I want you to jump in here. Um, the, the, the conversation has definitely evolved to sort of digital currencies. How are you viewing this? Um, is this a risk for banking as we know it? Or is this going to elevate your game? Well, listen, first, it really depends on the way it's built and conceived. And to a certain yeah. extent, the key question for central banks is whether or not they want to open, if I may say, directly current accounts for citizens and to a certain extent finance the economy, or maintain the banks as intermediaries mm. in order effectively to collect deposits and still finance the economy. I think there are debates, but from what but I But what did, do you from, want as uh, a bank? Uh, yeah. Listen, I, I would prefer to, to remain an intermediary <laughs> in the system than to disappear. So, no, more, more seriously, um, I, I, I hear that most central banks would not like to jeopardize the system of financing the economy. And in, in Europe, certainly, I don't think the ECB is willing to open directly current account and finance directly the mortgage uh, of uh, an Italian or a Spanish citizen. So I think, the, the, you know, there is a current discussion which is now open. It's a, an open discussion between the, the central bank and stakeholders who have contributed. It will last probably two years. But the fundamental idea is to maintain the, central, the, the commercial banks as intermediaries in the system and pursue their job of collecting deposits. And, and the governor is absolutely right. There is confusion in the terms. When people talk about neobanks, sometimes it's just payment institutions. The real specificity of banks is to collect deposits and to protect the deposits. And because of that, they are regulated, they participated to national sovereign uh, uh, deposit guarantee funds. We have constraints and we have duties. And I think that the, the central banks want to maintain the, this essential part of the system, which, again, nurture trust. If one day you have a big player and the money is disappearing, then the, your trust is gone maybe forever. And we are in a world where cybersecurity, by the way, is also a big risk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I want to go to, I mean, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about hyperinflation and inflation. Actually, it's come up already. As soon as you see an inflationary environment or hyperinflationary environment, trust is being eroded. My, the value of my money as a consumer, you know, means, I mean, it, 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 I, I can't buy what I used, used to be able to buy a month ago or a week ago, or if it's really, you know, a hyperinflationary environment like what we saw in Zimbabwe, then, you know, you're really talking about a dramatic um, experience. That's the big worry, that that erosion of trust might still be on the way when we have inflation coming through. So what does that then mean? 
for the future of banking and then the creation of money? Who's really going to be creating money in that scenario? Uh, if you allow me to comment, I think, um, you know, that's what I was say, talking about, knowing and understanding uh, the product itself when we're talking about the uh, cryptocurrency. But this is not everything, right? Uh, word now is about entrepreneurship and most of them are in the fintech space. Um, blockchain is another thing, um, which means less fees to the banks, right? Somehow um, uh, the banks need to allocate some capital and support uh, and invest in these uh, uh, entrepreneurs or fintech companies. And this is the way forward, I think. Technology is next. Fantastic. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. I want to uh, get a sense from all of you, in the next five years, who are going to be the winners and losers if we do get into an inflationary environment, if we are still currently going to be um, experiencing this uncertainty, which many people have been discussing as the big risk in the next few years. So, Tim, I can see you want to jump in here. So, let, let me first say something about uh, inflation, and, and, yeah. and it's, uh, it's what both Your Excellency and, and my neighbor uh, uh, said. Without uh, banks and without central banks governing uh, the, the relationship with banks, there is no check on inflation. So the idea that, uh, I mean, when we'll see what happens in Nigeria is going to yeah. be a great experiment. Well, but in my view, these are not that well thought through. And in big countries, in developed countries, you need a central bank, you need a banking system. And the only real benefit of, the only legitimate benefit of of cryptocurrency and blockchain is it's cheaper, faster, and banks ought to mm -hmm. take a lesson from that and figure out how to use blockchain, how to be cheaper, how to be faster, how to be more transparent, and they ought to be uh, supported in that by the central mm -hmm. banks. Who will be the winners? There will be a handful of uh, fintech winners, partially uh, because the nature of data uh, analytics will mean there will be segments that are winner take all. And if you're the best, uh, if you get the best data to score credit, you will ultimately price credit better than everybody else and everybody else will suffer and die if, that's, if, if, if data is proprietary. But the real winner, in my view, will be banks that cannibalize their historic business, that get rid of the inertia, that, that uh, believe in creative destruction, that adopt this technology even if it reduces their short-term uh, mm -hmm. revenue mm -hmm. from tr payments and transactions mm -hmm. and, and become innovators, customer-centric, and throw out the legacy costs, the legacy cultures. That's the thing. How do you get rid of the legacy infrastructure and the legacy banking system? How are you thinking about this, Frederick? How are you thinking of doing this? Yes, but I think that beyond effectively getting rid of or transforming the legacy IT system, I agree with, uh, with Tim. The big thing is, from a cultural point of view, agree to cannibalize your existing business. Can I just give you two examples in my bank? In 2014, I decided to launch within our bank an online bank, which was a direct competitor of our existing networks. Today, it's the largest online bank in France, and it will be a very profitable business, better than the existing legacy. Second, we bought also a startup which is providing back office services to neo banks. So we accept within our bank to help the competition to develop. And I think really it's by embracing the technology, accepting the disruption, and of course having to deal with the consequences of, on the people, and that's where it's difficult, that banks will effectively survive and provide, in practice, a better service. Because I think, I think technology will help banks to provide a better service to their clients. But we will remain, I think, uh, trusted partners. And that's very important. N not everybody will do that. OK, Hussein. Um, You're the winners and losers, who would you say the winners and losers are going to be in the next five years, would you say? So uh, I would say the way I would look at the banking in the next five years, I, I will be talking about the region uh, more. Um, I think now we are at consolidation phase. Um, uh, in Qatar, there was two, two, four banks consolidated, so two, two separate institutions uh, uh, merged together. Um, there is a capital uh, allocated for technology, I would assume, and I think uh, digitalization is not only external, 
to users, but also uh, in-house digitalization as well as important. Um, this is something happening at the moment uh, in the region. Um, winners will be those who would adapt and you know, uh, take the steps uh, today rather than later. Bob, based on current trends, yeah. yeah. Listen, the, <clears throat> the winners are gonna be, it's kind of what everyone said, um, started by Tim, the winners are gonna be those in banking that adopt change and uh, are not resistant to change because whether it's blockchain or digital currencies or you know Stripe in the credit card business, something is going on here from technology that is, that is extremely important. And I, I would say within that, two things. Um, you know, innovation is coming from um, outside of the banking industry. Yeah. We've seen it with Stripe, we've seen it with Starbucks, which has a massive uh, uh, card, and it's now happening in commercial banking with Circle. To, to Tim's point and, and Frederick's point earlier, that's why Circle wants to be a bank. We want to be a digital bank. We don't want to, we, we're not saying this stuff should happen outside of the banking system, it should happen inside the banking system. And I think over time, having some new entrants who are digital based and having the incumbents adopting digital based is, is kind of what the future is. But the other thing I'd say in, in, in to the governor and with, with respect, and I've said this um, uh, to the chairman of the Fed in the US, um, let's not assume that the China model of we have to have our own digital currency for the central bank is right for the West. The Fed wire was not created by the Fed. It was created by private actors and it was highly regulated by the Fed. And there's no reason that a stable coin or a digital currency from Circle or someone else highly regulated can't be adopted or, or multiple ones be adopted in a regulated environment. So I don't start with the assumption that the best decision here is for the Fed to have their own um, digital currency. But I do think, again, we need to become a bank, we need to be regulated, and um, a lot of the innovation is gonna come from the private sector. I would not wanna count on the government to, to really be the genesis of the innovation necessary in this space. But I think all in all of those things together, you know, I think, I think it's, it's the legacy banks who are willing to adopt change, and it's some of the new entrants that are willing to become banks will be the winners. So what happens, Your Excellency, if they don't adopt change, the legacy well, banks, if central banks don't think about the future? Sure. To your points, what's important to maintain trust is the players need to be properly regulated. Yep. Otherwise, we're gonna have chaos. The system gonna collapse. Yep. So, could we have in the future multiple forms of payment? Yeah. Uh, indeed, that could coexist with the fiat money, with the central bank digi digital, and eventually, uh, the best will survive. Uh, and so long the producers or the sponsors or the backers of any stable coin are properly regulated, I think that develop uh, comfort. In Saudi Arabia, here we started two years ago uh, in admitting uh, fintech companies into our sandbox, over 32, graduated 12 of them, um, uh, working now and operating in the areas of finance, in the areas of payment, in the areas of insurance uh, and other. And we already also um, launched our open banking uh, policy uh, paper for discussion. So we are open and we already started experimenting with central bank digital currencies along with others. So one thing for sure is that in the next few years, we're gonna see a lot of evolution. I don't think that will mean uh, totally going to be total destruction to the banking system. It has to be part of the banking system. How is that? That's what's going to evolve eventually. So, Your Excellency, I'd like to find out if you think, I mean, I want to, I want to get a sense of what is happening in the GCC. And I know there was talk of a regional currency at one point. Is that still on the cards? And that could that help solve some of the economic uncertainties that the world is facing, and of course the GCC will not be immune? Well, uh, first, uh, in the GCC, we already have uh, a uh, payment settlement system among the GCC countries. Uh, 
uh, of uh, multiple currency. It is uh, operational and already some yeah. countries and banks started working on it. We have another one on uh, pan-Arab uh, level. Uh, in the GCC, we have extremely similar uh, exchange policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, dollar peg uh, with uh, some of us is probably uh, more of a, a basket tilted toward the dollar uh, and therefore we do have the potential to uh, uh, more than any other region to move to a uh, digital uh, currencies so having uh, a digital currency for the GCC well, a central bank digital currency. Well, we need first to have a common currency, which yes, we don't. Yes, exactly. And then you create... And then okay. we can... And, and do you think that that would be one way of protecting the, the current backing system, would you say, in this region? And I'm help? Sorry? Would, would, do you think that that, that that would be one way to help protect the banking system in its current form in the region? <clears throat> that is... Uh, it could be... I mean, I, I think the banking system will be protected, even if we use central bank digital currencies. We need this intermediary, the banking. Yeah. There's a very important role for the banking. Any financial system without the banking, and this could be a fintech, could be a big tech. Any of those could be converted to a bank and be part of the banking system. Uh, so we should think of the banking system not as the traditional only. Traditional plus the new form of banks. Sounds like a, an opportunity, Bob. Sounds like an opportunity. <laughs> okay, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to go through around the room. Just a last comments, Frederick. Let's start with you. No, listen. There's also one topic we've not discussed, but which for banks, which is complex and which is yeah. related to trust. It's around the ESG, you know, because yeah. my fear is that um, for it will be difficult for us to convince that we participate to a rational climate uh, uh, tr uh, energy transition. And I'm a little bit worried uh, with this issue. Um, it's a real revolution for us. We have to think our businesses very differently. And again, we see very different stakeholders. Some of them, who, the level of understanding is limited and it's going to be something which might jeopardize the confidence sometimes. So for me, it's an additional topic on top of digitalization, which I put us alongside, which will mean in five years t t time, the business will be very different. The way to approach business So you're saying consumers and your clients are going to be looking at what your investments within the ECG space, ESG space? Again, we are going to accompany our clients in their own transition, the, geog the countries, the economies. But again, it's going to be a very sensitive topic if certain people do, do think that we are not going to m monitor and maintain the temperature at the right level. So the trust with the financial sector will be threatened by that. So that's wow. a worry for me for the coming years. Tim. Uh, I mean, I, I think I've said more than, uh, than I should have. I, I, if I had to say one thing that hasn't been said, I think that uh, in, the, in the world, in the FinTech world, there's a, uh, something behind it that's broader, uh, and that is the use of data, the ownership of data, the winner-take-all uh, inevitability of having proprietary data, proprietary insights and algorithms, and um, and I think we're we're watching uh, this unfold in a very ham-handed way with Facebook. The, the the concepts around regulating Facebook, I think, are are blunt instruments, but somebody needs to think really carefully about. Um, how we regulate the ownership use of data way beyond privacy, even beyond our traditional thoughts on monopolies and uh, and, and competition. But it's a it's a big thing, and I and I think there's very little deep thought on the topic. Hussein, um, I would actually add to to what Predict said here. Uh, Qatar Exchange, uh, stock exchange in Qatar have uh, you know. Uh, asked basically the listed institutions to issue ESG report and um, we in return as, as an investment bank uh, we have added ESG as part of our services uh, for you know uh, green uh, deposits or ESG um, stuff like that in addition I would say we'd like to um, be the first movers when it comes to uh, digital currencies would like to understand it better would like to be in the middle of discussions with regulators here in the region 
and this is something we'd like to do. So does it excite you when you, you know, when there's talk of potentially getting a regional currency and then that being transfer, transformed into a digital yeah. currency? Exactly. Look, for us, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. We will not shut down the discussions. We will not look, we do, will not look at this as a scary thing. Everything in you uh, is a challenge. So we need to understand it first, go through it, especially not, on, not only with the uh, product makers, let's put it this way, but also with the policy makers. And do you think that's happening quick enough for you? Would that be time. in the next year? Okay. It will take time. <laughs> it will take a few, time, a few years, actually, here in the region. All right. It will take a few years. Okay. Yeah. Policy makers need to act quicker. Come on. <laughs> we need to help speed things up. Bob, you're smiling. I know you've worked yeah, with many governments. <clears throat> for a final thought, I think the actions of the Fed and the Treasury at the, during the pandemic and other central banks and other treasuries around the world were unbelievable. Uh, yeah. They were fast. They were, um, you know, huge. Um, they really, really had a phenomenal and positive impact on all of us and all of our lives. But goodness gracious, it's time to, to slow that down. And I worry that the zero interest rates for 13, 14 years since the financial crisis, the cheapness of money, it's time to begin uh, tapering, stopping buying all the securities, think about um, getting rates back to a more normalized level, getting the yield curve to a more normalized level. And of course, inflation's a concern if that doesn't happen, but to me, the bigger concern is, is the potential for asset bubbles. And by definition, we don't know what asset or when that's gonna happen, but I worry about it. It's time to get, um, it's time to start to undo some of the stimulus. And that's not meant in any way about being criticism because I think I think the actions taken were phenomenal, but it's time to move to a, to a different um, different platform. Yeah, and that's going to be a big risk risk for banks as well if we risk for that. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Your Excellency, final comments. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, this topic and the evolution of the financial uh, industry uh, is going to continue with us. Uh, a lot of changes are happening from technology, innovation and the markets. Uh, the pandemic also gave us a different way of thinking of how to deal with and handle. Uh, I tell you one thing, you know, before the pandemic in Saudi Arabia, uh, only 32% of our transactions were electronic. Uh, post that is about 55%. Uh, so the circumstances uh, forced us to uh, move further into this uh, now our fintech are gaining more uh, transactions, uh, but most important is our traditional banks yeah. are technology-based uh, banks, and uh, all their services uh, almost are provided in, within technology uh, and uh, electronic payments uh, across all products and services. And, uh, I think uh, inflation is, uh, is an issue, uh, and I think it is going to be more resistance than transitory uh, for the next uh, 18 plus months, and we need to deal with it. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this uh, insightful conversation. I hope to see you soon in maybe a year's time, and we can talk about new exciting trends that will perhaps define what our financial sector would look like. Thank you very much. It was an honor to be on stage with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.